Okay, welcome. Um, if you clicked on this link, this is the audio version of your web-based coursework. Um, so this is our first web-based lecture, What is Yoga? Just to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to define yoga. And regardless of what branch of yoga you're talking about, there are three big ideas that fit them all. Integration, discipline, and conscious living. We're going to do a real quick and dirty history of yoga. Um, I'm also going to give you a little background on the eight limbs of yoga. Um, this is really important because we're going to spend a lot of time over the next several weeks sort of talking about these individually, but I want to get your brain sort of moving in that direction now. Um, I'm also going to talk about types of yoga. I'm going to give you guys a couple of types um, in terms of Eastern yoga or the more traditional yoga that you'll see. And then we'll talk about some of the branches of Western yoga that I really want you to be familiar with. And then at the end of this, you will have your first um, homework assignment that needs to be turned in via the Dropbox by noon on Friday. So defining yoga in a general sense. Um, if you bust open Webster's Dictionary and literally look it up, um, yoga means to yoke, pin, or unite. And what we're talking about here are the different aspects of the self into a unified whole. Um, so essentially, yoga is a way to attain a healthy body and mind. Uh, the classical definition of yoga that you'll hear comes from the Yoga Sutras, which are a compilation of sort of ideas about what yoga is. It's very traditional text, um, and most yoga teachers, regardless of what type of yoga that they're practicing, this is sort of their go-to reference for what yoga is and should be. And um, yoga, uh, sorry, chapter one, sutra two, actually defines it as yoga is a stilling of the movements of the subconscious mind. It's a little bit of a strange definition. I like to think about it more in terms of yoga is stillness or yoga creates stillness and stillness leads to awareness. Um, so that's sort of more the idea that I think about that. Um, so again, sort of keep that in the back of your mind. Getting back to that idea of the three big concepts that yoga always is. Yoga is integration. Yoga integrates the elements of the self. Um, whenever I say self or um, whenever you see it with the capital S, that means self as body, mind, and spirit. And the idea of integration means that these elements are inseparable. And something that affects one of them will automatically have repercussions in the other two. Um, the best example I can give you guys for that that you would be able to easily relate to would be think about how you feel during exam week, the mental stress that you're under, and then what happens. There are physical ramifications. Um, sometimes you don't sleep very well. Sometimes um, you're more hungry or less hungry, that sort of thing. So that's really what yoga is sort of getting at. Um, if you want to, you can think about it more in the, the traditional Latin sense that a sound mind must exist in a sound body. Yoga just adds it also needs to have a sound spirit. Um, so again, this is kind of looking at several pieces. When we talk about body, we're talking about keeping it healthy via diet and exercise. When we talk about mind, we're talking about keeping the mind healthy with breath control and relaxation. Spirit, when we talk about keeping the spirit healthy, we're talking about meditation and reflection, whatever that happens to mean for each individual person. Yoga means discipline. You'll hear me say that a lot this semester, um, that yoga is not something anyone can master. Yoga is something that we practice. Um, and what that means is that you're always searching for a stronger posture. You're always searching for stronger breath. You're always searching for some sort of new understanding. Um, there's, there's always something that you're working towards. Um, you should never come to yoga in your day-to-day -day practice and just say, I'm just going to go through the motions today. That's not the point. Um, the other way that I sort of like to think about it would be in relation to sports. Sports are skilled activities. Any of you guys who've ever played one knows that, you know, it takes time to learn certain skills. The yoga postures are the exact same thing. It takes time to learn them and learn them properly and really get good at them. So it takes repetition and commitment, just like it would if you were learning, um, 
you know, how to shoot a layup if you play basketball, for example. Um, so again, this idea that practice makes progress. Um, you're always learning, always improving, and it really teaches us to work within our own limits, both from a physical standpoint and a mental standpoint. And the, the really key thing here is that sometimes our limits change day to day. Um, you know, you might come in and be really flexible one day and the asanas might be pretty easy for you. And then the next day you come in and maybe you didn't sleep really well that night. So the asanas are a little bit more difficult. There's nothing wrong with that. You just have to learn to work within those bounds. Oops, I hit two buttons. Sorry about that. Um, yoga's conscious living. Um, conscious living is living to the best of our own individual abilities. We each have our own set of strengths and weaknesses. We're each good at something, not so good at other things. Um, but the idea is that you're working on improving at least one aspect of yourself every single day. It doesn't have to be huge strides, but you have to be paying attention to everything that's going on. Conscious living is living with respect to others, living with respect to the individuals in your life that you're coming across, whether they are important to you, family, friends, or whether it's just, you know, some stranger that you're in line with at the grocery store. Living with respect to groups of people. Um, we're all sort of born and raised in a certain time and a certain place, and that gives us certain um, sort of ideas about other individuals, um, you know, stereotypes and what have you. But the, the idea that regardless, they are human and they are people and they deserve kindness and respect. Um, living with respect to other living things. Um, certain branches of yoga are very big on the idea that animals and plants are also alive and they should be treated with a certain level of respect. Uh, living with respect towards our environment. Um, you know, on the big grand scale, Earth. We have one planet that is our home and that it is our responsibility to take care of it and make sure that, um, <clears throat> you know, we aren't being disrespectful to it. Um, so, you know, that obviously gets into a lot of the sort of sustainability things that are being talked about now. Um, and then again, on a much smaller scale, our own living spaces. You know, we each have a dorm or an apartment or, you know, whatever our living situation happens to be that we need to care for and we need to make sure is given its proper respect. Um, because without shelter, things are difficult. Okay. Changing gears a little bit. History of yoga. I could go really in depth on this, um, but I'm choosing not to and I'm choosing to keep it a little bit more simple for you guys because I think this is more straightforward. Um, yoga had its origins about 5,000 years ago in India. And again, regardless of what type of yoga, what branch of yoga you're talking about, it's always a set of teachings or practices that are geared towards some sort of increased understanding about that integrated self. Um, probably the two religions that are most closely associated with yoga are Buddhism and Hinduism. The Buddhists are known more for the meditation or the mental practice of yoga, and the Hindus are more closely associated with Hatha yoga, which are the physical practices of yoga. Um, in the US, uh, yoga was first introduced in the late 1890s, and much of the branching that we think about, you know, you pick up that group exercise schedule or you've got that schedule from the yoga facility that you want to attend to and there's like eight different kinds of yoga that are actually on it. Much of that branching in the physical practice of yoga actually occurred in the U.S. and Canada. Um, two names that I want you to know, I'm going to talk about them more later in this lecture specific to their particular influence on yoga, but two names that I want you to know are BKS Iyengar and Bikram Chuchuri. For most of you guys, one of those names probably might sound familiar already, but like I said, those are the two that I want you to know. Okay, theory of yoga. So as a general rule, yoga is just as much about philosophy and personal development as it is about exercise. Um, and we're hopefully going to be addressing both. Obviously, when we're in PE 107, we're going to be doing most of the exercise aspect. When you guys are doing your audio lectures and your homeworks and things like that, that's when we're really going to be talking about philosophy and personal development. 
yoga in the Western world, we think of as mind body, but we really focus, our focus tends to be more on the physical aspect of things. Um, for those of you guys who have taken a yoga class before, most of the time they do a Shavasana or final relaxation, but that's really a situation where sometimes it's very short, sometimes instructors don't necessarily care if you get up and leave at the end of class. That's something that we're going to do a little bit differently. There will be a final relaxation every day. This is not something that I'm going to allow you to skip out on. So get used to that now. Um, so again, when we talk about physical, we're talking about asana and pranayama. It'll become more clear what I mean by those in a minute, so be patient. Um, but again, this idea that, you know, there are yoga classes that we offer for lots of different things. You know, there's prenatal yoga and there's yoga for cardiovascular disease and there's yoga for stretching there's yoga for strength training etc etc so again that focus tends to be on the physical um, but true yoga is usually more about mental practices um, so there here we're talking about following the yamas and niyamas again hang on I will explain what those are in a minute um, here we're talking about the practice of meditation um, so again, really this semester, we're going to be talking about all of this. And getting in towards that, one of the most important concepts that we're going to spend some time with addressing um, is this idea of the eight limbs of yoga. These are two pictorial representations that you'll see really commonly. So like if you do a Google search on the eight limbs of yoga, you'll see these two pictures come up a lot. Um, it's represented as either a plant or a lotus blossom. So the picture on the left is of a plant, and the idea is that the limbs that everybody should be doing, whether they want to do physical practice, mental, mental practice, etc., but the things that everyone needs to take care of are sort of the roots of the plant, and then as you work your way up the stalk into the flower, things become more challenging and more complicated until you get to samadhi or enlightenment. The picture on the right is of a lotus blossom. Um, if you've ever actually seen a lotus flower, uh, the flower petals are actually not easily separated from each other. They're sort of entwined. So again, getting back to that idea of yoga as integration. Um, so that's why the eight limbs are often represented this way. The idea that all of them sort of build on each other. You need all of the different parts um, before you can sort of reach that enlightenment level. The representation that you guys will see the most from me this semester is going to be this color-coded pyramid. Um, I like the idea of a pyramid because again it gets back to the idea that the stuff at the bottom is the base and if the base isn't strong you're not really going to be able to build up to enlightenment easily. Um, the other reason that I like it is because it is color-coded it's sort of easy to sort of keep straight which parts go with which parts. <clears throat> So the bottom of the pyramid, we have what I deem the limbs that are sort of our codes of conduct. Limb one are your yamas. Yamas are social restraints. Those are things that we avoid doing for the betterment of all. Um, limb two are the niyamas. Those are individual observances. Those are things that are done for the improvement of the unified self. Um, so again, those are sort of things that hopefully are being done regardless of whether you're continuing on with the physical practice or the mental mental practice of yoga. Hatha or the physical practice of yoga is represented um, by the two green levels on the pyramid. Limb three is asana. Asana is posture. Whenever you hear me say asana, I want you guys to be thinking warrior one, downward dog, um, half moon. All of those postures are asanas. Okay, I will use posture and asana fairly interchangeably, but that for sure is a Sanskrit word that I want you to know. Limb four is pranayama. Um, again, I will use pranayama quite frequently, so that's also a Sanskrit word that I would like you to know. Um, pr pranayama is breath control, um, and that just refers to breath as life force, um, and that how we inhale and exhale can really affect a lot of different things, both physically and mentally. Um, so we'll do a lot of hopefully interesting exercises with that, this, this term. Limbs five through eight, I sort of group together. I call these the higher order thinking limbs. This is where you're moving from the physical practice of yoga to the mental and spiritual practice of yoga. 
these four limbs don't get super hung up on the Sanskrit words. I'm presenting them to you so that you see what they look like. Um, but I will most likely refer to these guys with their English equivalents. Um, limb five is pratyahara, and that would be what we would sort of call sensory withdrawal or selective attention. Limb six is dharana, which is focus. Limb seven is dhyana, which is meditation. And limb eight is samadhi, which is enlightenment. Um, again, the reason that I group these together is because the boundaries in between these particular limbs are much less clear than it is with the first four. Um, again, because it's a more mental and more spiritual practice. Um, but again, we will be talking about all of them. So the different types of yoga. I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, there are a handful that I want you to know that I would call classic or more traditional Eastern methods. Um, and then we'll talk about the different branches of the Western. So the big ones that I want you to know that are, are sort of classic. Karma yoga, path of selfless action. The idea of karma yoga is that you're performing duties to the best of your ability without any expectation. Um, karma is the idea that the sum total of your actions in one life can um, either elevate or demote your position in your next life. Um, so it's a kind of esoteric concept, but the idea that do good things, good things happen to sort of really simplify that. Um, Bhakati yoga is path of devotion, and this isn't necessarily associated with any particular uh, religion, um, but it's a devotion to life force. So again, getting back to the idea that plants and animals are also due respect because they are living things. Um, practitioners of this branch of yoga are often vegetarian, you know, for the idea that animals are living. Um, and mantra yoga is path of voice or sound. So this is um, either oral or mental repetition of a sound or a word. So when you think of the traditional, you know, a group of monks sort of chanting in that, um, that's mantra yoga. That's a very specific branch of yoga. The two types of kind of the traditional yoga that I want you guys to be the most familiar with, because this is what we're going to experience and this is what we're going to talk about most this semester, are hatha yoga and Raja or Ashtanga Yoga. Hatha Yoga is that physical path, that asana and pranayama. We use it for strength training, flexibility, and posture. Pranayama is also really important in terms of relaxation and releasing physical blocks. Um, again, the idea here is that you're cultivating a mind-body connection through stillness of the body in particular poses. So essentially, hatha yoga is a static asana or posture held for several breaths before you move to either a neutral position or into your next posture. Um, so again, when I say asana, think warrior one, that sort of thing. Um, but holding that particular pose um, and allowing your body to sort of become still and comfortable in it. Raja or Ashtanga yoga is path of meditation. And here's the reason why I showed you the eight limbs already. Raja means nearing samadhi or ashtanga means eight limbs. Um, I will use these two words interchangeably. They basically mean the same branch of yoga. Um, but it's considered to be the highest form because it does integrate all eight limbs. And this is what we are really going to be trying to attempt this term. Okay, We're really going to look at all eight of those and make some attempt to really get to know what each one of them mean and how they work or can work for us. So this little guy is basically a picture representation of all of the different kinds of yoga that exist in the Western world. So all of those different branches that you can get. And um, it's in the uh, plain PowerPoint that is posted, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, you know, going through things right here. Um, if you really want to get down with the nitty gritty, um, I'll leave that to you to kind of play around with. But there are a couple variations that I want you to know. Um, again, if you've got that group exercise schedule in your hand, these are probably the ones that you have seen on that schedule and that are most familiar with at least what the word looks like. So power yoga. Basically what power yoga is, is um, hatha yoga on steroids. 
Um, it uses advanced poses or extended pranayama to increase your strength gains. Um, so power yoga is really where you get into a lot of the hand balancing postures. Um, the picture of the, the girl on the right is uh, crow pose, your headstands, your handstands, things like that. This is also where you get into holding a posture for a very extended amount of time. Um, we may dabble a little bit with uh, holding pranayama for extended breathing, but we're not going to be getting into the advanced postures. I'm not going to ask you guys to stand on your head. Um, vinyasa is flowing asana. Um, so essentially what vinyasa is, it's using pranayama, it's using that breath control to flow steadily and evenly from one asana into the next. Um, the easiest examples that I can give you guys for this, um, the picture on the, the lower right is a pictorial representation of sun salutation. Sun salutation is a vinyasa that's meant to be done upon waking at the beginning of the day. And again, it's flowing in from one pose into the next using your inhale and exhale pattern. Um, Shadaranga, for any of you guys who have already taken a yoga class, is another very common vinyasa. Um, so again, these we probably will dabble with this semester. Um, it will probably be in the later weeks as we've gotten more comfortable with the standard asana postures, though. Iyengar yoga. So this is going back to those two names that I want you to know. This is a type of yoga developed by BKS Iyengar. Um, essentially what this is are standard asana, but he uses blocks or props or straps or something that basically ensures proper body alignment. So these are two sort of pictures kind of giving you an idea of what that would look like. Um, the pose in the top picture is a uh, triangle posture and the pose in the bottom picture is downward facing dog. Um, you'll see this kind of yoga done a lot for therapy. We are gonna use it in this class for overcoming anatomy and overcoming blocks. Um, so the reason that I asked you guys to all make sure that you have a bath sized towel every time you come to class is because we can use those as props or as makeshift straps. Um, you'll see me use it a lot. I have very short upper body, um, my arms, so particularly for me in things like triangle pose or half moon, it, it's very helpful to me. So just because I ask you to use it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means that I'm trying to help you keep your spine the way it's supposed to be. And Bikram yoga. Um, Bikram yoga is also called hot yoga. So what Bikram yoga is, it's a series of 26 asanas, um, which is the picture to the right, and they're repeated because right side of the body, left side of the body. Um, we call it hot yoga because they crank up the temperature in that room to 100 degrees at least, sometimes a little bit more. Um, the reported benefits of it is that it allows a release of toxins via your sweat. I mean, obviously, if you're exercising in 100 degree heat, you're going to sweat a lot. Um, and also the heat will cause uh, muscle flexibility. Um, it'll cause an increase in that. So... So there is a huge following for Bikram Yoga. We're not um, going to be experiencing that this semester. Um, exercising in a room that warm is very dangerous. Um, if you are interested in it, I can help you try and find a class. But again, that's not something that we're going to be tackling in this, this class this term. So that is the end of our first web-based lecture, and that brings me to your first homework assignment. What I'd like you to do is reflect on the information in this lecture and submit a paragraph or so detailing a couple of things that you're interested in learning more about this term besides the proper postures. Obviously, we're going to be covering that a lot in um, when we're actually in class Tuesday, Thursday mornings, but things that you're interested in learning beyond that. All right, I will see you guys next time.